Welcome to the podcast on Properties of Water. You'll be using your guide notes to follow along, but feel free to pause at any time to review. If I were to ask you what your survival needs were, I know most of you would answer with the same answers. We need, all need food, we need oxygen, the air that we breathe, and I'm sure most of you might even say your iPod, your iPhone, your Facebook, whatever it is. Okay, but there's one other thing. What makes water so special? Why is it so important? Why is it unique? Why is it considered the universal molecule? Let me share with you a couple of these things. If you look at the picture of the human body, you'll notice that the blood actually goes from head to toe, right? So the blood is actually made up of 83, at least 83% water. And your blood is very, very important, very crucial for carrying important nutrients, minerals, and the necessary chemicals throughout your body. And it's also important for helping to get rid of the waste. In that beautiful picture of the brain there, did you know that your brain is at least 70% of water? So what I suggest right now is that you pause this video and that you go help yourself to a nice glass of refreshing water because your brain is going to need it. Water is really important, um, it's specifically the structure. So in order for us to understand a little bit about its properties, we need to understand its structure. So the unique structure of water accounts for all of its properties and its functions. The living biosphere, our blue planet, is made up of at least three quarters or 75% of the uh, Earth's surface. I'm sorry, 75% of water. 70 to 90% of your cells are made up of water. So if you draw your attention over to the picture on the corner there, you'll see that this particular bacteria cell is made up of 70% water and 30% chemicals. Okay, the chemicals are broken down over here into sugars, fats, um, DNA, RNA, and other ions and other molecules, which we'll get into at a later time. The water molecule is considered a polar molecule. Let's focus on the word polar here. What does polar mean? Do you know of anything else that might be polar? I can think of a couple of things. One thing that comes to mind is the Earth is polar. It has a both north and south pole. Okay, or magnets. Magnets also have a north and a south pole. Excuse me. Okay, or a positive and a negative end. So similar, similarly, water also has a negative and positive end whereas the oxygen tends to be slightly negative and the hydrogen tends to be slightly positive. Okay, So assuming that we know what the water molecule looks like, I'll just write it at the top of the screen here. It's written as H2O, meaning for every two atoms of hydrogen, we have one atom of oxygen. So the oxygen end tends to be slightly negative and the hydrogen ends tend to be slightly positive. There's an unequal sharing of electrons, and that what that's what causes it to be polar. Seeing that it's a polar molecule, this is the reason that it causes it to be attracted to other things. What other things? Things such as other water molecules, other polar molecules, and other charged particles, and we call those ions. Okay. What actually bonds these together? or what glues the water molecules together or sticks them together, connects them together, is hydrogen bonds. So bring your attention over to the picture and you'll see that between the water molecules you'll see a bond. There's one, two, three, and four. Four bonds. You have a hydrogen connecting to an oxygen, a hydrogen connecting to an oxygen. Okay, Opposites attract so it makes it very easy for those water molecules to actually bond together. Some new vocabulary we need to look into before we continue. One such word is called hydrophilic, the other is hydrophobic. So as I mentioned in class, I want you to focus on the prefix and, and the suffix in this case to figure out what this word possibly means. So hydro, if we break that down, can refer to water. And philic refers to love or loving, which is from a Greek, um, a Greek word. It means having a tendency to mix with or dissolve with water. So think of some things, and even if you want to refer back to last year's science class, 
What are some things that are very easily dissolved in water? I'm just going to draw a beaker here, okay, and it's filled up with water. Okay, if I were to put a teaspoon of sugar, okay, in this beaker of water, you know that the sugar, or even if it were salt, would very easily be dissolved, okay, and that would be considered hydrophilic. Hydrophobic, on the other hand, okay, and I'm sure you can guess what this means by the word phobic. Okay, water phobic means to fear or to repel, okay, or fails to mix with water. Okay, just like this sorry little mosquito over here, when we spray on our mosquito repellent, we're repelling or we're um, uh, chasing or scaring the mosquitoes away. Okay, so hydrophobic. Can you think of anything that might be hydrophobic? Let me draw another beaker. We have some water in here. Okay, how about oil? If I were to put a certain amount of oil into the beaker, you know that the oil is going to rest on top. It will not mix with the water. Okay, and if I were to stir this around, I might see some droplets of water mixing through the beaker, but they certainly won't dissolve in the beaker. Eventually, these droplets are going to float back to the top, okay, with their other oil little droplet friends, okay? So hydrophilic, having a tendency to mix with or dissolve in water. Hydrophobic, having a tendency to repel or fail to mix with water. And we'll look into exactly why are these two characteristics um, important. Another word we're going to look at is amphipathic. Okay. Amphi sounds like amphibian, doesn't it? If you look at these two critters here, we have two amphibious critters. The word, or excuse me, the prefix amphi actually means both. Both of these animals live partly in water and in land, or at least part of their life cycles exist in water and exist on land as well. If you look at the laundry detergent over here, it is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, okay? So why do we have to have both characteristics in our laundry detergent? What makes it successful? Okay, the hydrophilic part is that we want to attract water molecules to our laundry in order to get it clean. Okay, so if I have my soiled shirt here, okay, so I want to attract the water molecules. On the other hand, I want to fear or repel, okay, this soil. So I want these dirt particles to go away from my shirt. So we can see that it's both hydro and hydrophobic qualities to the laundry detergent. Okay, so in our example here, we're referring to lipids, and another word for lipids, we can use the word fats. Lipids and fats also have hydrophilic and hydrophobic characteristics, okay? What I am drawing here is something that makes up part of your cell membrane. Here's the head of the fat, and here's the tail of the fat. Here's the tail of the fat, and here's the head of the fat, or the lipid. Okay, and so part of this is hydrophilic and part of this is hydrophobic, and this actually makes up your cell membrane, which we'll get into at another time. Water is very sticky, so bring your attention to this little critter over here, okay? The water strider. And if you look closely okay, at these areas here, what is happening? What is happening is that um, the fact that water is sticky, it is also very cohesive to each other. So each and every individual water molecule in this little um, pond surface is sticking to each other. It's cohesive. It can form up to four hydrogen bonds, and it coheres to other water molecules. Okay, The fact that it does this, it makes it especially strong at the surface, almost creating like a film, so it makes it very, very strong and causes surface tension. Okay, so you know when you do a belly flop in your pool, how much that hurts? It's because of the quality of that water is very sticky and very cohesive, okay? So this is the surface tension is very, advant very advantageous to this um, water strider. It makes it able to actually move across the pond. Another quality of water is adhesion. 
So we have cohesion and adhesion. Adhesion actually helps water molecules bond to other molecules besides itself. Okay, And what allows it to do this is its different charges, the fact that it's polar, the fact that it has positive and negative ends to it. So it's attracted to other charged molecules. This allows the water to actually climb up the stems and roots of plants, and we call this capillary action. Capillary action actually defies gravity. Okay, it actually defies gravity. I mean, how you can't get any exciting, uh, ex more exciting than that, right? So what happens here? Let's look at over the uh, picture of the tree here. Okay, we have uh, individual water molecules forming in the soil or falling to the soil through means of the water cycle, goes up through the root system, through the trunk of the tree, through the branches, to all the leaves here, okay, and eventually out, okay. All right, so what is the benefit of this? The benefit is, is that it's actually delivering minerals and nutrients throughout the entire tree, okay. So there's no way that water could actually travel such a distance, and especially in the, these tall oak and pine trees that we have in our area, without this capillary action, okay? So it's defying gravity, but how does it actually do this? It does this through its uh, qualities of adhesion and cohesion. Bring your attention over here. So you see the hydrogen bonds through the individual molecules. Okay, you see the hydrogen bonds. They're sticking to each other as well as sticking to the sides of these very important tissues that are bringing up the water through the, um, through the stems, the leaves, and the branches, okay? Let's review a couple of those words that we just went over. So looking at the picture, you can see that there's a lot of water droplets forming on these leaves. Okay, here's one, for example. There's another and another. Okay, what is actually forming these droplets? What property of water is contributing to the formation of these droplets? Okay, cohesion. Okay, helps with the formation of the droplets. Okay. And if you notice that they're almost perfectly spherical shape, okay? And it is surface tension that's contributing to this spherical shape. So if you were to draw a picture of a water droplet in your notes, so here's the, the edge of the leaf or the surface of the leaf, and then we have a water droplet with all of the forces pulling inward here. Okay, all the forces pulling inward creating the spherical shape. So we have cohesion, which is causing each water molecule to bond to the next. We have surface tension, which is contributing to the spherical shape here on the leaf. Okay, and the last one is adhesion. What does adhesion do? What is adhesion contributing to? Okay, it's allowing the water droplets to stick to the leaf. Okay, because water is sticky. And why is it sticky? Okay, it's sticky because of its, its polar qualities. It has both positive and negative charges. Let's uh, t uh, talk a little bit about physical properties of water. Okay, water has a very high heat capacity. Okay, so big deal. What does this mean to you? Okay, well, one thing is, is that it takes a lot of energy for it to heat up. And this is good news, good news for a lot of reasons. Okay, for those of you who are driving right now, this is the perfect explanation as to why water is a very good coolant for your radiator. Okay, okay. one reason we should care. The other reason, oceans actually absorb heat from the sun. They spread it throughout the planet, which actually regulates global temperature and it also regulates our seasonal changes. And this is why we go from uh, one season to the next, very moderately speaking, okay? It's not a very drastic change from summer to fall, fall to winter, okay? We gradually go um, through all four seasons throughout the year. 
And oceans act like air conditioners in the summer, and they act like heaters in the summer due to this very high specific heat capacity. Other physical properties of water are the three states of matter. Now, this is going to sound very familiar to you. you as you know, uh, water does exist as a gas, liquid, and a solid, but What's unique about this is that water is the only molecule that actually does this naturally, okay? That it can exist in all three states of matter in nature, okay? And what's even more unusual is that the solid state is actually less dense than the liquid state. This is very unusual. So if it's less dense, what does that mean for all of our ponds and our lakes and things that freeze over in the wintertime? Take a look at this pond system here. I can see the snow cover, so I'm assuming that it's frozen. It's frozen on top because water is less dense in its solid state than in its liquid state. So why should we care about this? Can you think of the answer or why this is beneficial? The fact that water is less dense in its solid state. Okay, the reason is it's because all of the aquatic life can exist on living <laughs> and make it to the next year. So. Fortunately, the ice is on top of the pond and not on the bottom, and therefore all the aquatic life is able to survive yet another year. We can't talk about water without talking about the pH scale. Okay, This might be new for some of you um, and might be review for others. So when we talk about the pH, we're, um, we're actually talking about how acidic or how basic it is. If you were to take apart the water molecule, what would it actually look like? Okay, we would actually split it up into hydrogen ions, and as you remember, ions are charged particle, and hydroxyl ions. Okay, so we have um, H over here, and then we have the OH over here. Now, depending on if a solution has more hydroxyl ions or more hydrogen ions is going to depend on how acidic or how basic it is. Bring your attention to the scale, and you'll see that the scale runs from 0 to 14. Okay, could you read the scale from 14 to 0? Yes. Could you read it from left to right, right to left? Yes. Okay, just as long as you know which end of the scale is more acidic and which is basic. At the top of the scale here, we have 0, 1, 2, 3. And notice that these things are very acidic. Okay, battery acid, couldn't you couldn't find anything more acidic. The gastric juice or your stomach acids are in between a 1 and a 2 right there with lemon juice, okay? Why do your stomach juices have to be so acidic? That's right, because we have to break down our foods in order for them to continue on through our digestive system, okay? So you have tomato juice, you have rain water anywhere between a five and a six, you have pure water um, around seven, okay? Notice how saliva tends to be a little bit towards the acidic end of the scale. Blood, on the other hand, or your tears tend to be um, heading in the direction of the more basic side of the scale, okay? Seawater, milk of magnesia, or if you think of Tums or something like that when you have um, like acid reflux or something like that, and then we go all the way down to ammonia, bleach, and then oven cleaner, okay? So we have more hydrogen ions on the acidic end of the scale, and we have more hydroxyl ions on the basic end of the scale. We have pure water right in the middle at number seven, and you notice that there's an even distribution between the hydrogen ions and the hydroxyl ions. So the pH scale measures the amount of basically hydrogen ions in solution and ranges from zero to 14. Okay, why do we care about pH and what effects does it have in nature? Okay, if you were to look at the the map here that I have in the bottom of the screen. You can see that the scale, anything in green, is around a 5.3, 5.2. As you work your way down into the oranges, 4.3. Okay, so from green to orange, does it become more acidic or more basic? It becomes more acidic. So you can see all on the east coast, we tend to be more acidic. The Midwest, um, you're getting less less acidic, and then as you uh, move out to the west, you're going to be become even more less acidic, okay, or more basic in other terms. So this is the um, pH scale as of a few years ago on precipitation, which means the, the rainfall and the snowfall that we get, okay. 
So what does this mean to our wildlife, our lakes, our rivers, our streams, our oceans? What does this mean when things are totally out of whack as far as pH is concerned? Okay, so our, remember that pure water okay, was actually at a 7. Okay, In fact, the retention pond right outside our school is a perfect 7 as of last week. It's a perfect 7, which is, which is pretty unusual. We found some terrific specimens. You guys had the opportunity to look at those macro invertebrates um, and some beautiful algae under your microscopes. It was a, evidence of a very healthy ecosystem. Okay, so we had the perfect pH of a seven. Now, once that pH gets too high or too low, you are gonna, not going to see the biodiversity. Okay, if it gets too if it gets to be too acidic, obviously the fish are going to have trouble um, living in such conditions. Okay, so you'll start seeing more um, invasive, maybe moss species starting to take over in an acidic environment. Okay, so it's going to change your ecosystem drastically, and that's why we should care about the pH. Okay, so if you need to pause, if you need to review this uh, podcast at any time, feel free to go back to your notes and listen to this podcast as often as you need to.